dance with the spirit early in the morning and walk with the spirit throughout the long day. Work and hope for the new life of born and listen to the spirit to show you the way. Dance with the spirit. Hi everyone. Welcome to a new way that we will be meeting together, a new way that we will be worshiping and finding ways to connect ourselves with the Holy in these coming weeks. And so just wanting to welcome you and hoping that you enjoy this time and what we put together for you. So we're in the middle of, of Lent and through Lent, which are six weeks leading up to Easter, Northminster has been exploring the stories of Holy Week. So we're on to week four now, and we're looking at a story that is full of extravagance in a showing of, of care and compassion toward Jesus, but at the same time, it was still full of risk. And so we ask ourselves where we might find ourselves in the story, that we maybe put a frame around the story, like it's a picture on a wall, and we we look for how uh, we would fit into that frame, how we would fit into that picture, where we would find ourselves. So that's what we've been doing every week with a different story. That's what we're doing this week as well. And I just hope this will be a time for you to pause and reflect and to put yourself into that story and try and discover a, a deeper understanding of the holy in your life and in our lives and in who we are as a church in this new time. So besides the Last Supper and Holy Week, there's this other story. There's this story that happens at a dinner and Jesus um, and his followers are gathering for a meal and this woman shows up and unexpectedly anoints Jesus in this very extravagant uh, showing of devotion. So imagine yourself in the story and we'll hear this story now. Um, it is taken from Mark chapter 14 and you can find it in other spots um, in the Gospels as well, but we're going to hear it from Mark chapter 14 this morning. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over Jesus' head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You'll always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. None of us around the table liked the way things were going here in Jerusalem. The conversation had turned once again to the dire situation for the many people we had encountered. Those who were hungry, poor, sick, disturbed. But does the Roman state care about them? No. At least we try. Every penny we can scrape up, we try to pass on to those who need it. I had to wonder, though, whether the talk of asking our patrons for more money right now was really because we were afraid. Before Jesus arrived to dinner that night, some of the disciples had said, with the way things were going, perhaps we should be saving money in case we needed to hide out in the not-too-distant future. And then she walked in. I saw the jar she carried, beautiful, alabaster, 
And as soon as I smelled the oil as she began to anoint Jesus, I knew it was nard and it had been expensive. And there was a lot of it. Across the table, others were beginning to stop their conversations and looks of contempt began to cross their faces. Mumbling began. Do you know how much that kind of oil costs? It seemed a ridiculous waste, given what we had just been talking about. That kind of money could go a long way. I looked down at her. I was close. And although she had not said a word, I could sense her intensity and devotion. This love lavished on him was somewhat embarrassing, and yet it was what I really wanted to do. Tell him how he changed my life and how finally I felt I had a purpose in my life. I felt loved. And it was such a gift. But how can you offer a gift to this beloved one? He is the anointed one, anointed by God. But here she is, anointing him. I realised that what I felt was jealousy, mixed with deep fear that we were losing him. And I think we were all afraid of losing him. He tells us to stop judging her. She is preparing me for burial. No, I thought, don't say that. It can't happen. Later, I will remember her, just as he asked me to do. And I will remember that he asked us to care for all people the way she cared for him that night. So a few weeks ago, we were talking about how the stories of Holy Week often reflect the highs and the lows of our own lives. So at the beginning of Holy Week, it was Palm Sunday and how everyone was shouting Hosanna. And then just a few days later, Jesus' popularity drops to them shouting crucify him. And just how much in our own lives, there's often that tension from the Palm Sundays to the Good Fridays and so on. So in life, we could think about in families when a new baby is born, there's a lot of excitement and often around the same time or soon after there's the sadness at the loss of a grandparent or there's the excitement and celebration as a young adult goes off to university and and then there's the the sadness when that same person experiences a lot of anxiety or other mental health issues or maybe it's the maybe it's a, a a milestone anniversary for a couple and there's celebration to be had and then suddenly one of those one of the spouses discovers um, a difficult receives a difficult diagnosis so it's even been like that the last few weeks hasn't it because there's just so much changing so fast um, we've gone from normal life and, and things happening as they as they should so to speak and suddenly we're we're anxious about the virus and people are feeling isolated and there's the stresses of job loss or kids missing activities and friends at school and so there's just so much happening and so i think i think it's just an acknowledgement that our lives are are really complicated sometimes and even when we think about the story today today's story in our worship time is no different and so we can look at the woman with her anointing of Jesus and we could we could ask ourselves, why do you think this woman did that? Uh, the oil she she used was expensive. It was incredibly expensive. And so is her doing this an example of incredible generosity? Well, to some, no, it was just plain wasteful. And so there's that tension again, that high and low, that that differing perspective on, on what was going on in that story and in the lives of the people who would have witnessed that story firsthand. I wonder if that woman had a sense of what, go, of what was going to uh, happen to Jesus in the coming days. Is that why she did it? Certainly Jesus recognizes that that it was that that anointing was a preparing him for what was going to happen but did she know that maybe she was just caught up in the moment maybe she just couldn't help herself maybe you've done that that you get 
so caught up in a moment of doing that, so caught up in a moment of gratitude for something that's happening in your life that you just forget everything else. You even forget yourself and you simply give thanks. Maybe that's what was happening for her. That maybe, perhaps, she is one of those countless people in Jesus' life who he touched. That maybe he healed her in some way. Maybe he helped her in some way. Somehow he changed her world, maybe. And so that was her moment. It was her opportunity to pour out this blessing of thanks, of gratitude on Jesus. So what are you thankful for? That's a hard question uh, to think about when so much has changed, um, when children have been missing out on school and activities and people are fearful and worried about their health and some are so anxious they're trying to just hoard as much as they can and we laugh at that sometimes, but it's a really tense time for lots of folks. And so whether you're missing your friends or your church or your community or your work, you know, answering that question of what are you thankful for, that's a hard thing to do. But let's ask that question anyway about gratitude, because I think in these times, darkness, well, maybe, maybe you've heard that phrase, you know, you don't really see the light until there's, there's cracks in the darkness and then the light shines through. So maybe it's one of those moments that in a, in a darker time, we're seeing where the light really does shine for us. Where do you, what are you thankful for? Maybe it's a time to be at home with your kids when you really have been missing that. Or maybe, maybe suddenly and thankfully that rat race schedule you've had is slowing down and pausing because you've cleared your slate of all activities and you're just at home and having a chance to be. Or maybe we're seeing neighbors reaching out to neighbors like never before. And we're seeing strangers connect in their communities and find ways to be helpful. I really like what someone said this week. It's been nice to see society actually pull together in ways that only the church has done for so long. That society is being the church. They're reaching out and helping one another and caring for those around them. So that, that's definitely a, a, something I'm thankful for this week. So, so what's that one thing for you in which you could be wastefully and extravagantly thankful that you could just feel that overwhelming sense of gratitude for something this week? Think for a moment and, and then let yourself be caught up in that similar act of devotion and gratitude for that person or that experience or, or that thing or whatever it is. So that's our story for Lent 4, and we're going to hear more of these stories in the coming weeks as we work through Lent together. Uh, stories that affirm that life isn't simple, that life is complex with its highs and its lows and its, its joys and its challenges. And uh, these stories, these stories we're, we're going to hear will continue to I think confront those difficult realities of life and remind us that God's love is, is maybe the only thing that helps us make sense of it all. Um, God's love doesn't explain it away. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't explain why, why we have struggles, um, but it just makes sense of all these complexities that makes it a bit maybe easier to bear. So Palm Sunday at one end of the journey and Good Friday at the other. And thankfully, we know that Easter is beyond that. And we'll keep working through all of this together so that we all know we're not alone. So that's our reflection for this week. Um, Sarah Corgan, our pianist, has prepared our theme song that we're using from Entering um, the Passion from Marcia McPhee's Worship Design Studio series. So we'll leave that for you now to listen to. And then we hope you'll tune into Facebook Live at 1030 on Sunday morning. We'll, uh, we'll explore the, the, th the theme a bit more and check in with each other and lift up prayers together. So we'll see you, see you Sunday morning on Facebook Live at 1030. Bye for now.